Hello, I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Today, on Personally Speaking, I'll be joined by Dr. George Weigel. George Weigel is Distinguished Senior Fellow of Washington's Ethics and Public Policy Center and a New York Times bestselling author. Please stay with us. Hello and welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and Dr. George Weigel joins me now. George Weigel is Distinguished Senior Fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He's a Catholic theologian and a New York Times best-selling author. George Weigel is perhaps best known for his widely translated and internationally acclaimed two-volume biography of Pope St. John Paul II, the New York Times bestseller called Witness to Hope, and its sequel, The End and the Beginning. In 2017, George Weigel published a memoir of the experiences that led to his papal biography entitled My Unexpected Life with St. John Paul II. George is the author of more than 20 other books, and his essays, op-ed columns, and reviews appear regularly in major opinion journals and newspapers across the United States. His weekly column, The Catholic Difference, is syndicated to 85 newspapers in seven countries. He's also senior Vatican analyst for NBC News. George Weigel received a Bachelor of Arts from St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore and a master's degree from the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto. George's latest book is called Not Forgotten. And then the uh, subtitle, Elegies for and Reminiscences of a Diverse Cast of Characters, most of them admirable. Included in this book are uh, St. John Paul II, of course, media personalities like Cokie Roberts, Charles Krauthammer, William F. Buckley Jr., Sergeant Shriver, and the Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and so many others. Uh, George Weigel is here with us today to talk about Not Forgotten, which not only looks death squarely in the face, it takes the opportunity to reflect, really reflect, on the lives of more than 60 individuals and what those lives can teach us about the human condition and how to live in today's world. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome back to Personally Speaking, Dr. George Weigel. Uh, we are here with Dr. George Weigel. We're talking about Not Forgotten, which is, I got to say, I've read probably most of your books, uh, but George, it's its so magnificent. I read the thing in one sitting, loved it. I think uh, for my listeners around the country, I hope that they're going to get the book, Not Forgotten by Dr. George Weigel. Now, let's start with a couple of things first. Last week, we had on uh, a friend of yours, Dr. Ryan T. Anderson, this new president of uh, ethics and public policy, who's going through an experience of uh, censorship with his book, When Harry Became Sally. In all the many, many writings you've done, doctor, ha have you ever personally experienced the problem of people deciding that you weren't politically correct and therefore we didn't have to listen to you? And if you did, what's, what's the proper response for Dr. Anderson or for you? I haven't run into the kind of problem that, that Ryan has run into, uh, which is really despicable. I mean, Amazon is a private operation. They can do right. whatever they want. Right. But it is censorship, pure and simple. Mm. It's woke censorship. It's politically correct censorship. <laughs> right. His book is a very thoughtful, compassionate, well-reasoned look at the whole transgender enterprise. Uh, and it simply uh, falsifies the claims that are being made uh, for this, frankly, bizarre business today. Right. And uh, I think people need to understand what's going on here. Um, as I put it in my Catholic press column uh, Wednesday, this so-called Equality Act, which puts transgendered identity into a protected civil rights category, right, right. is an attempt to criminalize the book of Genesis, <laughs> biblical anthropology, the Catholic, Christian, Jewish view of the human person. Uh, and it's doing so in the name of a false compassion for obviously troubled 
people. Gender dysphoria is no joke. But I know many psychiatrists who have dealt with these problems. Uh, and their view is that there is no clinical evidence whatsoever that transgendering improves mental health and life outcomes over the long term. And in fact, there's an awful lot of evidence that it increases suicide rates, especially among teenagers and young people. So um, if you want to follow the science, you get people suffering from gender dysphoria some help, psychiatric help, uh, spiritual help, uh, but you don't send them to the chop shop, yeah. uh, if I can put it as crude. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ryan has done a real public service uh, by writing this book. It's shameful that Amazon has behaved this way, uh, but this is the cultural moment we're living in. And if I can actually drag this conversation back to my book. Right, please. <laughs> I, I think one of the reasons people are enjoying this book is that it lifts up political figures who were serious people. Mm -hmm. Henry Hyde, the leader of the pro-life movement, Scoop Jackson, who put human rights on the agenda of U.S. foreign policy, Lindy Boggs, longtime member of the House of Representatives, later ambassador to the Vatican, Sergeant Shriver. Uh, these were serious people. Uh, they didn't look at politics as some kind of performance art. Right. They looked at it as a, as a vocation, as a way to get things done for the common good. So uh, I'm very pleased that people have told me they found this book encouraging. And I hope uh, some of the political figures I lift up. Right. No, I, I intend to give it out widely in my own parish. I think it's a perfect gift for the people. Uh, Dr. Weigel is our guest. The book is called Not Forgotten. I want to focus on one particular chapter. And not surprisingly, you write so eloquently about uh, Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II. But going back to when you first did his official biography, how did you, like when I read your stuff on him, including this essay, you get him like nobody else gets him. I'm wondering how do you did that? And also, he clearly got you because he chose you. Uh, how did that dynamic happen? We first met for the first time in 1992, um, but he had known about me before that. He knew that I was interpreting him here in the United States in a way that he seemed to think was you know, appropriate and, and uh, accurate. And I, you know, I, I think we just had what the old uh, Thomists would call a co-natural affinity uh, for each other. We cared about the same things, uh, in, including uh, obviously Christ in the church, but also in the public space, human rights, religious freedom. Uh, and, and we both believe that the church had something to say to ordering modern society uh, in a just way so that uh, individual freedom uh, contributed to the common good uh, and social solidarity. So it was a very uh, robust relationship for uh, 13 years. Uh, and uh, there was never an awkward moment in it. Uh, I think we sort of got each other and yes. uh, things went on from there. That's so clear. You know, one of the first books I read, George, as a kid was uh, uh, by Ray Carrison called Bishop Walsh and Mary Knowles. I knew plenty about Bishop Walsh, got to meet him up in Austin when he came back. But Bishop Ford was not someone I was really familiar with. And you you do a beautiful chapter on him as well. My My question for you is the horrors that he went through under communist deprivation and torture, unfortunately, uh, there seems to be, that's alive still. Do you have any insights into what we as a, a free people are supposed to do in dealing with our economic partners who are so oppressive to so many, and specifically what the church is supposed to do in terms of saying human rights abuses in China must be challenged? Uh, actually, I have that book, Bishop Walsh of Marinol, Prisoner oh. of Red China by Ray Harrison, two floors down from me <laughs> in, my, in my library. Uh, I actually met Bishop Walsh after he was uh, released when he came to the 
Cathedral of Mary, our queen in Baltimore, which was our, my home parish. And uh, uh, we met uh, then prior to him saying mass there. I have been interested in the Bishop Ford case for years and uh, frankly got nowhere in trying to get the fathers of Marinol <laughs> to push his beatification cause. They said, that's really not our affair. It's the Diocese of Brooklyn. Well, Brooklyn has taken it up, uh, but it seems to me to be being put on ice mm. uh, in the Vatican because of this, frankly, uh, rather stupid and, and certainly uh, disturbing approach to China mm. that the Holy See has taken uh, in recent years. Uh, you do not get along with totalitarians by kowtowing to them. John Paul II understood this and became an agent of liberation in Central and Eastern Europe. Why this has not been understood in the relevant offices of the Vatican is one of the great mysteries of contemporary Catholic uh, life. So I frankly do not expect to see Bishop Ford beatified, as he certainly should be. He's mm -hmm. obviously a martyr. This is a no-brainer. Uh, anytime soon, until there's a change in uh, approach in the Holy See. Uh, as for the United States, I think one point of continuity between the immediately past administration and the president, president administration is that they both seem to understand that you're dealing with an aggressive regime here. Yeah. And that particularly on the human rights front, uh, there have to be uh, not only rhetorical corrections, but there has to be a sanctioning of people involved in this. Uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo, uh, Secretary mm -hmm. of State Mike Pompeo was very strong on this during his years as Secretary of State. And it seems that the Biden administration, for all that it's getting everything else wrong or many things, <laughs> else, uh, right. you know, has taken this up as well. I mean, there's a genocide going on in northwest uh, China with these Muslim Uyghurs, uh, period. And uh, at the same time, some very prominent Catholics uh, my friend Jimmy Lai, mm. uh, the great democracy activist Martin Lee, are on trial in Hong Kong and are not being publicly supported by the Holy See. This is shameful, and it ought to change. Yeah, totally agree. I, I wrote a letter to our people recently about Jimmy Lai and just said, uh, Al D'Amato had said to me years ago when he lost his last election, that he, uh, he was impressed with the fact that Chuck Schumer, even though he had done so much for Israel and the Jewish community, Chuck Schumer had pulled back his uh, people to support him. And he said, I wish Catholics could be uh, more supportive of their own. I thought of uh, Jimmy Lai and uh, how sad it is that we are not universally saying to China enough, you know. Um, Dr. George Weigel in the book, Not Forgotten, also has a chapter a uh, very kind chapter actually about Father Andrew Greeley. And while they might theologically or philosophically not be on the same team, I was struck by your kindness to him. But I was also thinking that his criticism of bishops and the church, uh, which was colorful back then, would be considered today relatively mild compared to uh, some of the on-site scenes from both the extreme right and extreme left in tearing at the church. What do you make of uh, these websites and organizations that are, are so passionately critical and frankly, so nasty about our church? Look, there's plenty of things that need to be fixed about the church, I know that, but some of the stuff is uh, close to evil. Oh, it's not close to evil, it is evil. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's spreading falsehoods yeah. and uh, uh, discord. Let me let me quote myself. This is the first <laughs> sentence in the acknowledgments of uh, page of Not Forgotten. If there is one thing the internet, the blogosphere, and social media should have taught humanity, it's that God invented editors for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> is I that mean, the truth? All, all writers fret 
or chafe under editors, but there's a, there was a reason for editors for hundreds of years. Editors were gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Editors kept garbage off right. pages when, when they could, when they recognized it as such. In this new world in which everyone is his or her own editor, it's it's uh, it's the wild west, right. and unfortunately, a lot of people, some of whom I think are deeply disturbed, mm. have discovered that they can make a nice living out of all this, and that the more you rev up the hysteria, uh, the more you can raise money. And there's something uh, there's something wrong about this. I wrote a it was my New Year's 2020 column in the Catholic press saying that people really needed to be a lot more discriminating in their the websites they visited, the, their social media uh, activity. Uh, and I just got hammered by some of the more hysterical people who said <laughs> that I was trying to shut them down. Um, well, that simply reinforced my point that the hysteria mongering was being used uh, in no small part for fundraising purposes. Yeah. And unfortunately, the condition of the country, the world, and and some aspects of the church are such that hysteria sells. So uh, I think we're all going to have to learn to be a lot more, if I may use the word, chaste about our consumption of these materials. Uh, Dr. Weigel is being followed today. Our second interview after you, Dr. Weigel, is by Harry Connick Jr. Oh. I, met, I mentioned I love Harry, but one of the questions I will ask him, and it pertains to what I'm wondering about yourself, is Harry's father went to Mass every day, and uh, he was the DA in, in uh, New Orleans, and he went to a Mass where the same priest said the Mass every day, who turned out to be one of the most notorious uh, children abusers. And I want to ask Harry, how did his father's faith how is it impacted on that? Now, you're so close to the church, but you've lived with us through all this nonsense. Were you shaken at all by the church or your faith in the church in seeing some of the abuse that took place and some of what was covered up? Not really, uh, Monsignor. And I think the reason for that uh, really goes back to my uh, youth. Uh, okay. My pastor, when I was a young, well, I was a boy and a young man, was a very close friend of my family. And uh, he had brought my grandfather into the church. Uh, He was a close family friend. I discovered when I was in high school that this guy had a serious alcoholism problem. Ah, okay. And I was kind of shattered by that. And then, uh, you know, through the grace of God, Uh, I came to understand that this was somebody that I should empathize with and help in any way I could, rather than hold in the kind of contempt that, you know, young people can often hold elders in when when they're disappointed. So uh, this man who did get himself straightened out uh, at the end of his life and and died a holy uh, death, um, really taught me a lesson about you know, not being scandalized by the human failings of, uh, of the church. Uh, so no, I can't say that there was any uh, pressure mm-hmm. on my faith. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff going on that uh, just boggles my mind, <laughs> and, uh, particularly not so much now on the sexual abuse front. I think that we, we've addressed that rather successfully in the church mm-hmm. in the U.S. But, you know, for example, financially in Rome. I mean, this is scandalous. And, uh, you know, my dear friend, Cardinal George Pell, tried to do something about that. Uh, you will never convince me that the uh, persecution that he experienced was unconnected to all of that, although there were people who were out to get him long before uh, he was brought to the Vatican to clean the stables Mm -hmm. there. So it's 
It's a reminder, Monsignor, of something else that's worth thinking about during Lent, and that is that Satan is not a metaphor. <laughs> uh, there is, There are real evil forces at work in the world. Yeah. And if you don't recognize that and try to armor yourself against them, uh, they're going to take a run at you. Yeah. Dr. Weigel is our guest. Dr. Weigel has many books out, not just Not Forgotten. And I mentioned that to our listeners because he has an amazing gift for writing and insight and uh, putting together profound theology and philosophy in a way that's uh, understandable for regular folks like us. I, I mentioned that, Dr. Weigel, because uh, I want to ask you the what I call the Derek Jeter question. When we had a, a TV show with Derek on it, I said, every kid in America wants to be a great baseball player, successful, popular. You have it all. Why would God, of all the people in the world he could give it to, give it to you, Derek? And he said, I don't know, but I don't want to ask him. He might change his mind. In the same, <laughs> <laughs> in the same way, why? Why do you think you've been given a precious, wonderful gift to touch people intellectually and emotionally? And uh, I mean, you really, you have a gift. It's a wonderful gift. Why did God choose you to give that gift to? I've tried to live my life vocationally for many decades now. Uh, and I hope that that has been in response to the question, you know, what is God asking me to do now? What am I being asked to do uh, today? Uh, you know, as for whatever uh, skill I have in translating what can seem complicated or abstract ideas into terms that that uh, people can understand. I think that comes from teaching uh, mm -hmm. and writing. You really don't know what you think and believe until you try to teach it or write it. Yeah. And uh, students have taught me a lot over the course of my life. And, uh, you know, I, I've written something like 2,000 columns in the Catholic <laughs> press over the last Three, three or four decades. Um, and, you know, you, you just learn after a while how to uh, translate mm. uh, abstruse material into more accessible yeah. uh, material. And I think of that as, as part of my uh, vocation. Uh, we've been, for all of the troubles of the church, this has been a great... Uh, really century or more yeah. of intellectual growth in the church. And that should not be uh, understood by academics only. Uh, others have a, have a right really to share in, in the richness that has been plumbed from the Catholic tradition uh, and made available to, to people in the 21st century. So if I can help a little bit to do that, uh, I'm happy to do so. You, you, you do, in fact. Uh, Dr. Weigel's writing also, I think, draws its strength from courage kind of to say the truth in season and out of season. I mentioned that there was one column in particular that you had written, Dr. Weigel, that uh, I said, he's going to get flack from this. You're con you consider it to be a Catholic conservative, but you were taking gently uh, Pope Benedict to task for still wearing his white cassock and being the Holy Father Emeritus and saying, we have one Holy Father. And I thought when I read this, he's right. But he's going to get so much grief. Did you get much grief for that? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, as a matter of fact, I had an exceptionally robust conversation with the Pope Emeritus <laughs> in October 2019 for about 50 minutes. I mean, we were talking about everything under the sun. And uh, while he was very frail physically, uh, he was completely lucid. And uh, it was just great to see him again. We hadn't seen each other. And uh, in many years, and it was great to reconnect. Look, mm -hmm. he's a big boy and <laughs> understands right. that there are different views of this. Um, I, I still think that the, the church needs to think more uh, deeply going forward about, you know, what does, what is the position of, of uh, popes who have, who have abdicated the office. Mm -hmm. uh, which is really, the, I think, the correct uh, term in this case. Um, but that's not something I'm, th that is not high on my list of right, right. things uh, right uh, now. Uh, no, I usually get uh, more flack for uh, uh, 
challenging political correctness mm. uh, or, um, or frankly, defending the Second Vatican Council. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I spent the first 25 years of my writing life getting whacked from the left. And now I'm getting, you know, whacked from uh, a different direction. And in both cases, I think part of the, the difficulty is a profound historical ignorance. Uh, some of the people who are bloviating about the Second Vatican Council today, I am quite confident, have never read its documents, <laughs> have no idea of what the history of of the church from the mid 19th century on that led up to this was. I tried to write a book about this called The Irony of Modern Catholic History, about how this confrontation with modernity had, had, had actually led the church to rediscover its evangelical and, and missionary uh, uh, essence. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, the trads paid no attention. They're not <laughs> interested any more than part of the progressive world is interested. I want to uh, thank Dr. George Weigel for being with us. Uh, he's a magnificent writer in person. Uh, this book, Not Forgotten, is something I hope people will read widely. And for my brother pastors who are out there, I intend to share it with the people in the parish, and I'd encourage everyone to do that. Uh, you serve such a great purpose to the world, to the church. You're a very, very good man and a good writer. And, and thank you, Dr. Weigel, for sharing your time and your book, Not Forgotten, with us. Thank you, Monsignor. It's always good to be with you. God Same bless. here. As we end today's program, I want to thank you all for being with us. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach me at Personally Speaking Podcast at gmail.com. To listen to Personally Speaking, uh, the podcast with some of our most recent shows, you should also go to YouTube and search under Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. And don't forget to check like and subscribe. Personally Speaking is also available as a podcast on personallyspeakingpodcast.buzzsprout.com. You can also listen to past episodes by going to www.closeencountertv.com and clicking on the radio button at the top of the page. You can also find past shows and Monsignor Jim's weekly homilies by going to www.ollmp.org. Go to the homepage, and if you're able to help us support us in any way in our radio ministry, we'd be deeply, deeply grateful. Personally Speaking is also on Facebook at Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Please share and let others know about Personally Speaking. Personally Speaking is made possible with the help of many generous and wonderful individuals. I hope you'll be one of them. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer, personally speaking. Our producer is Lisa Jandovitz. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.